Well, I hope you've had a wonderful week. It's certainly been a hot week. It's been a hot week in the South, and as I understand, in the in the Midwest, uh, it's just it's it's really been a scorcher. But we're in summer, and it's supposed to be hot. And we just passed the the midpoint of our summer. And and gosh, I I say this every week because. I'm no less certain today than I was back the middle of March when we first started doing these online Sunday school lessons when things are going to normalize to the extent we even understand what normal is anymore. But, but I, almost, I also know that, that we are going to get beyond this. We are going to get to the end of it. Um, and we're going to have learned a lot as part of that process. Uh, today our, our lesson continues in the book of Daniel. And, of course, the summer series is all about community, and I've said this each week, that I think it's absolutely a God incident that when this was put together, probably started, the writer started over a year ago, that they had no idea what we'd be dealing with this summer and, and how important community is. Not that it's not important otherwise, but this summer it's been even more important as, as community as we've known it has, has changed. Uh, the lesson today is... Uh, the purpose statement for the lesson today is to help God's people endure in faith despite the consequences. And the focus is on our always faithful God. Now the book of Daniel is an interesting book. And, and the, while this story that we're going to share today, uh, everybody's known it. Everybody that has ever attended a Sunday school class or a Bible school class or, or, or read the Bible is familiar with the story of the fiery furnace. And yet I dare say that you've only thought about it in a, in a very cursory sense. You've thought about it from the standpoint that we're here, um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego get thrown into a fire furnace, uh, a fourth figure. Um, some people who read the Bible say it was Jesus. Some say it was an angel led them out of the furnace. And, and that's pretty much your understanding of it. And that's certainly part of, the, part of the story. But Daniel itself is an interesting book. It's an interesting book because for some reason, chapter 1 and chapters 8 through 12 were written in Hebrew. Chapters 2 through 7 were written in Aramaic. And, and no one really understands why that was. 1 through 6 are wonderful stories. They're, they're, they're great stories. Our story today, our lesson today, comes from one of those, those stories and stories that we remember well. And 7 through 12 are, are visions, um, the visions of the apocalypse, uh, visions of the end of times. And so, you know, we've, we've got almost two books in, in one book, in the book of Daniel. Now, I'm going to read today's lesson from the message, and I'm going to read all of chapter 3. Our lesson really doesn't pick up at the beginning of chapter 3, but I think it's important to understand the background. The message, uh, as you know, was written by Eugene Peterson. It, it's written in language that is more common to us. And because this is such a wonderful story, I wanted to use that, and I'm going to comment uh, as we read this along the way starts out in chapter 3 and it says, King Nebuchadnezzar built a gold statue, 90 feet high and 9 feet thick. Now let's just stop there for a second. 90 feet high. 90 feet high would be, what, 8 stories high? We don't have buildings 8 stories high in, uh, in Cornelius. I think there is a, a new project going up, a condominium project, but 8 stories high is this statue and 9 feet thick. He set it up on the Dora Plain in the province of Babylon. Now, we, we know that Babylon was a, a sinful place. We know that the, the people of Israel were enslaved, were taken to Babylon with the fall of Jerusalem and were enslaved there. He then ordered all the important leaders in the providence, everybody who was anybody, to the dedication ceremony of the statue. They all came for the dedication, all the important people, and took their places before the statue that Nebuchadnezzar had erected. A herald then proclaimed, When you hear the band strike up, all the trumpets and trombones, the tubas, the baritones, the drums, the cymbals, fall to your knees and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. Anyone who does not kneel and worship shall be thrown immediately into a roaring furnace. The band started to play a huge band equipped with all the musical instruments of Babylon, and everyone, every race, Every color, every creed fell to their knees and worshipped the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Just then, some Babylonian fortune tellers stepped up and accused the Jews. They said to King Nebuchadnezzar, Long live the king! You gave strict orders, O king, that when the big band started playing, everyone, 
everyone had to fall to their knees and worship the gold statue. And whoever did not go to their knees and worship it had to be pitched into a roaring furnace. Well, there are some Jews here, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have placed in high positions in the province of Babylon. Now, you will remember from last week's lesson that that was about not eating the king's food, being true to their God and eating only food that would have been kosher to them. And when they became healthier, when they looked better than the people who had eaten the king's food, the king then said, you're special and I'm going to give you a special place. And so, obviously it bothered him. I mean, here's these three people that I've given a special position to, and you're not doing what I'm telling you. These men are ignoring you, O king. They don't respect your gods, and they won't worship the gold statue you set up. Furious, King Nebuchadnezzar ordered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to be brought in. When the men were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar asked, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you don't respect my gods and you refuse to worship the gold statue that I have set up? I'm giving you a second chance. But from now on, when the big band strikes up, you must go to your knees and worship the statue I have made. If you don't worship it, you will be pitched into a roaring furnace, no questions asked. Who is the God who can rescue from my power? Now Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered King Nebuchadnezzar, Your threat means nothing to us. If you throw us in the fire, the God we serve can rescue us from your, fiery, your roaring furnace and anything else you might cook up. But even if he doesn't, it wouldn't make a bit of difference, O king. We still wouldn't serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. Nebuchadnezzar, his face purple, with anger, cut off Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace fired up seven times hotter than usual. Now think about this for a second. Think about what we just read here before we go on. And I want to focus for a second on King Nebuchadnezzar. Now here are these three guys, these three young men, and he had given them a special place in his palace. And they refused to do what he ordered everybody in the nation to do. And it said he got furious. And then later on it says that his face was purple with rage. Now think about Nebuchadnezzar and think about anger. I think about that a lot. I think, well, what happens when we get angry? What happens? We, we, we do. Our blood pressure goes up. We, 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 we have this need to we want to clench our teeth. We want to, we want to be mad. We want to attack. But when we do that, we start to lose control. And, and, I, and I think when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego responded to him, I don't get the impression here that they responded in anger. Here's the king. Here's the king who has the power to do anything that he thinks he wants to do. They're refusing to do it. He's angry to the point where his face is purple, his blood pressure's up, he's wanting to attack, he's wanting to prove He's wanting to prove that he's right and nobody's going to tell him what to do except he's going to tell everybody else what to do and you better not refuse him. And I don't get the impression in their response that they just fire back at him. Look at the way they responded. They, they, they respond by saying that your threats don't mean anything to us. I get the impression that they look at him and that your, your threats they don't mean anything to us. We're, we're not going to worship your God. We're going to stay true to our God. And our God will save us. But then look at what they say. But if he doesn't, if he doesn't save us, we're still going to stay faithful to him. That's powerful. And can you imagine when somebody's angry, when they're mad, they want you to fire back. They want, they want you to be in attack mode too. Let's go ahead. Let's get it on. Let's get it over with. I mean, let's fight. And when somebody doesn't want to fight with you, it takes a lot of wind out of your sails. So we read that Nebuchadnezzar, with his face purple with anger, he, 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 he's mad. He ordered the furnace fired up seven times hotter than usual. He ordered some strong men from the army to tie them up, hands and feet, and throw them into the roaring furnace. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego 
bound hand and foot, fully dressed from head to toe. They had their clothes on, they just grabbed them, they bound them up, they were going to throw you in the furnace, were pitched into the roaring fire. And because the king was in such a hurry, and the furnace was so hot, flames from the furnace killed the men who carried Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to it, while the fire raged around Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. So here's the king. He's angry. He's mad. He's furious. He's in a rage. And isn't it true when we get mad that sometimes we do things that we don't mean to do? He didn't intend for his men to be killed. But he was angry. He wasn't thinking clearly. That's what anger does to us. And when that happens, we lose control. He lost control and he ended up killing innocent people that were trying to do what he wanted them to do. Suddenly, King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm and said, Didn't we throw three men bound hand and foot into the fire? That's right, O king, they said. But look, I see four men walking around freely in the fire, completely unharmed, and the fourth man looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar went to the door of the roaring furnace and called in. Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the high God, come out here. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego walked out of the fire. All the important people, the government leaders and king's counselors, gathered around to examine them and discovered that the fire hadn't so much as touched the three men. Not a hair singed, not a scorch mark on their clothes, not even the smell of fire on them. Nebuchadnezzar said, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He sent the angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They ignored the king's orders and laid their bodies on the line rather than serve or worship any god but their own. Therefore, I issue this decree. Anyone, anywhere, of any race, color, or creed who says anything against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be ripped to pieces limb from limb, and their houses torn down. There has never been a god who could pull off a rescue like this. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now it's kind of funny when we, when we think about the, the very last thing that we read here where he promoted them. He was obviously feeling guilty. He, he saw that the, this god that they worshipped was the one true god, was a powerful god. No other god could have done that. And, and, and I look at this story, I think about this story, and, and it is an incredible story. I, I think about, first of all, the idol. I mean, what are things that we bow down to today? I mean, we, we think it's silly to say we're going to bow down to it. You know, of course, if there was a nine-foot statue and somebody said to bow down to it, we'd say, no, we're not going to do that. But we have a lot of other idols. We, we, we do have idols. We, we have money. We, we, we have fame. We, we have power. We have other people that we bow down to, that, that we talked last week, that, that we're imperfect, and when we bow down to other people, we're, power, we're bowing down to other imperfect people. For some people, it, it's drugs. I mean, drugs are a huge problem that, that, are, that are taking over people's lives. I, 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 I think about all of the things that we point to that are more important. We don't want to admit it at the time. When we reflect back on it, we really don't want to admit it then either. But they're more important than focusing on the one true God. I mean, here were these three young men, and they wouldn't bend to the ways of the world. But they were rather, they were willing to take on the ways of the world because of their faith in God, even if it meant risking the fiery furnace. Now, we're not in a fiery furnace today. But we're certainly in an incredibly challenging time, a time unlike any that I can ever remember before. And, 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 and it's wearing on us. It, it's, it's, it's taking our energy. It's, it's taking our time. And, and faith in rough times call on the strength of God. Faith to withstand the pressures that we're under. Faith to take on the challenges. Faith to not bend under pressure. And I wrote down a few things that I was thinking about and, and in the great book of excuses, what, what these three young men could have done. Look at what their excuse could have been rather than the fact that I'm going to worship the one true God, I'm going to be faithful to the one true God. 
they could have said, hey, if we get ourselves killed, then who's going to be here to look after the Jewish people? I mean, we just wouldn't be good to anybody if we were dead, so we need to figure out how to get along. Or, or they could have said, well, this is a foreign land. We got sent here. We didn't want to be here. They do things differently here in Babylon than they did in Israel. And, I mean, after all, we need to fit in. I mean, you've heard the expression, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. So let's just figure out how to make it work. They, they could have said, well, okay, we'll fall down this time, but we're not going to actually worship your, light, your idol. We're going to act like we are, and you're not going to know the difference, but we're not going to say anything. If we say anything, it'll just be mumbles, and you won't know what it means anyway. So, so we'll, just, we'll just kind of play along. Or they could have said, yeah, we'll do it this one time, because there's all these other people around, and we'll go ahead and, and, and join with you, but by golly, we won't do it again. They could have said, well, gee, the king did give us some pretty good jobs in his palace, and maybe we, we don't need to upset that up in court, so let's, let's just try to figure out how to make it work. They also could have said that, hey, our idols set up, or our, our ancestors set up idols at one time. And, and, I mean, after all, I mean, people do sin once in a while. And, 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 and if we sin, if we do it one time, we can always ask for forgiveness. I mean, that's just, that's, that would be all right, wouldn't it? I also think it's interesting that they weren't certain they'd be rescued. You know, so often when we get in the middle of something that we, we really don't understand, that we're challenged with, our prayer is that we want it to just go away. Take it away from me. And yet that isn't what they said. They said they'd be rescued. They said it would be taken away, and that's ultimately what happened. But they were willing to admit that if it didn't, they were still going to be faithful to their God because they wanted to let God be God. So I think about that when I think about how we pray. I think about the reaction of Nebuchadnezzar, who, who got angry, but then came back and, and in his own way asked for forgiveness for his mistake. I, uh, I've shared this story before, and it's, it's, a, it's a story I think of often, and it's a personal story. And I think about anger, and I, and I clearly, anybody that's been around me, knows me, I mean, I can get mad, I can get angry. And sometimes I've reacted in ways that I'm not proud of, that, 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 that were not appropriate. And, and early on in, in Judy and my marriage, and I can point out exactly where we were, it's so vivid in my mind. We were, we were driving down, for those of you that, that are in our Sunday school class in this area that are, that are listening to this, we are driving down Jaton Road. And I can't tell you, I don't know, bet. Um, what the fight was about, what the argument was about. But I said something, she said something, I said something, she said something. Next thing you know, she's, I'm, my voice is raised, I'm mad, she's in tears. And we're driving back to our house back in, uh, in the peninsula. And as we got to the garage door, put the door up, and we're just, we're, we're mad. And I say, I have no idea what it was about now. As I put the door up, she looked at me and she said, pray with me. I pulled in the garage, turned the car off, and I looked at her and I said, go ahead. She said, no, you pray with me. Now I'll tell you something, my friends. I was angry. And that anger didn't last very long at all because you can't go to God in prayer. You can't take the time to stop what you're doing and pray for God's guidance and be angry. It won't happen. I have no idea what we were arguing about. Have we argued since? Oh yeah. Yes we have. You can't, you can't live with somebody and not have disagreements. But praying brings focus on God and God's relationship with us and helps us strengthen our faith. So my friends, in this very trying time, these very trying days, will you pray with me please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, we, we come to you today. We, we continue to come to you. We're, we are frustrated. We're angry. We've had things taken away from us or things restricted from us that, that, that we don't understand. We have, have friends who are dealing with health issues and they're not able to, to even visit with family members to, to check on their well-being. We have friends that we're not able to, to visit with like we'd like to. We're challenged in the way that we, we've 
been able to come together as a community. And yet we know, we know that you're in charge. We know that you're going to lead us through. And we ask you today for continued patience. We ask you today for continued wisdom, that you, that you guide us in our interactions, that you guide us in our words, and you guide us in the way that, that, that we view the world, that you continue to keep our eyes open to those things you want us to see, our ears open to the things you want us to hear, and our hearts overflowing with the love that you put in each and every one of us. And there's never been a more important time for us to share that love with others. In his name we pray. Amen. I look forward to seeing you again soon, my friends.